Imagine yourself transported to a time of turmoil and transformation, an era that the Book of Revelation describes with vivid and unsettling clarity. John, the biblical visionary, had his eyes opened by the Lord himself to see beyond the veil of time, capturing visions that transcend human understanding. The visions revealed to John describe a future where society and the world order undergo a dramatic shift, a change so profound that it marks the beginning of the reign of the Antichrist and the events. This period is depicted in scriptures as a time of trials and tribulations where the fabric of reality and faith is tested. For many, the prophecies contained in the book of Revelation may seem terrifying, shrouded in mystery and hardly understandable, especially for those outside the faith. This complexity can make it difficult for some to believe or even take these warnings seriously. However, the purpose of these prophecies is not to sow fear, but to inspire a life dedicated to Christ. They serve as a beacon, guiding the faithful through the storms of time, offering not only warnings, but also promises of redemption. Among these apocalyptic messages, we find in Revelation 9 one of the most significant and impactful warnings. As we progress through the book of Revelation, we come closer to chapter 9 a passage that transports us directly to the heart of the tribulation, a period of intense divine judgment and destruction. In this dark scenario, the Antichrist has risen to power, implementing the system of the beast. In this new world, freedom of trade and movement is restricted by the mark of the beast, the infamous 666, without which no one can buy or sell. As the world writhes under the weight of these dark times, we witness the judgments of the seven trumpets, a series of divine punishments signaling God's wrath upon humanity. By the time we reach the sixth trumpet, we are confronted with one of the most severe warnings of the apocalypse. Revelation 9 verses 13 and 14 speak of a voice echoing from the golden altar before God a voice commanding the sixth angel to release the four angels imprisoned by the great river Euphrates. The release of these angels marks one of the severest judgments, comparable to some of the most devastating events in biblical history. If you thought the great flood of Genesis was an event of cataclysmic proportions or the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, an extreme example of divine justice, brace yourself. What follows is of a magnitude that transcends everything that came before. As we delve deeper into the complexities of the events described in Revelation, a question inevitably arises, why the river Euphrates, and who are the mysterious angels mentioned in the text? Yes, we're talking about the same river Euphrates that cuts through Asia, the same river that witnessed the rise and fall of ancient empires. Its mention in the book of Revelation sheds new light on end-time prophecies, revealing deeper layers of meaning. The four angels imprisoned in the river Euphrates are enigmatic figures. Unlike the angels we typically associate with majesty and divine service, these are angels who rebelled alongside Lucifer and now serve Satan. The question of their presence and the role they play at such a crucial moment reveal the duality and conflict in the spiritual realm. When we think of angels, it's common to imagine them as muscular and powerful beings, servants of God like Michael, the archangel of war, the leader of the heavenly army. Michael is the one who intervenes in the most spiritual battles, as in the story of Daniel, where he fought against the prince of Persia to ensure that the divine message reached Daniel. It's a testimony to the power and authority that these celestial beings possess. On the other hand, we have Gabriel, known for his appearances to biblical characters like Zechariah and Mary, the mother of Jesus, bringing messages of hope and divine announcements. And we can't forget the figure that appeared to Joshua before the Battle of Jericho, a celestial commander armed and ready to lead God's people to victory. We encounter the mysterious figure of the angels imprisoned in the Euphrates River. Unlike the angels that often appear in biblical narratives with clear divine missions and celestial purposes, these angels in Revelation 9 are distinctly different. They are not God's messengers. 
Instead, they are beings who deviated from their original mission and became instruments of destruction. The existence of these angels is not an isolated act in creation. They began their celestial journey as part of God's hosts, but turned into fallen angels on the day Lucifer, the bearer of light, decided to challenge divine authority. Lucifer, with his enigmatic charisma, not only rebelled, but also persuaded a legion of angels to follow his dark path. The ensuing celestial confrontation culminated in the victory of Archangel Michael, resulting in the expulsion of Lucifer and his followers to Earth, marking the beginning of evil's manifestation in the human world. The fallen angels were then chained in the Euphrates River, a location laden with symbolism and history. The reason for this specific location may initially seem enigmatic. However, a deeper analysis reveals that the Euphrates is not just any river. It flows through regions that have been settings for significant events in human history, including Eden, where the first acts of transgression and violence unfolded, such as the murder committed by Cain. By linking these angels to the Euphrates, the scriptures suggest a thematic continuity of rebellion and consequence. They were confined to this specific location, not randomly, but as an act of profound significance, reflecting the persistent nature of evil in the vicinity where sin first entered the world. Nimrod, the mighty hunter mentioned in Genesis 10, is a central figure in this context. It was he who instigated the construction of the Tower of Babel, a monument to human ambition that defied the heavens themselves. However, God, seeing Nimrod's heart and the corrupted unity of his followers, confused their languages and scattered humanity, bringing an end to the project. This narrative highlights an important premise. Just like Nimrod, the four angels imprisoned in the Euphrates symbolize a significant threat. Although the exact details of their crimes remain a mystery, we can infer from their riverine imprisonment that they possess an exceptionally perverse and powerful nature. The fact that they are confined under a river indicates a need to contain them in an extraordinary manner, suggesting a wickedness that exceeds that of common demonic forces mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, such as in Ephesians 6 verse 12, where the struggle is not against human adversaries, but against evil spiritual entities in the heavenly realm. The magnitude of their wickedness is further evidenced in Revelation 9, when God decides to release these angels as part of his divine judgment against the wicked and unrepentant. This release is not just an act of punishment, but a startling sign of the worsening tribulations at the end of times. The revelation that each of these four angels leads an additional host, totaling an army of 200 million spiritual beings, as described in Revelation 9 verse 16, is particularly revealing. This evil army symbolizes a force of massive destruction, unparalleled in scope and power. As John progresses in his apocalyptic visions, he offers us a detailed and terrifying description of the four angels released from the Euphrates River and their hellish army. Their breastplates gleam in shades of burning red, dark blue, and sulfur yellow, evoking images of a devastating force ready for battle. The horses they ride are likened to the most fearsome beasts with heads like lions and their breath exhales smoke of fire and sulfur. The tails of these creatures are described as serpents, each detail emphasizing their dangerous and destructive nature. This army was not just released randomly, they were meticulously prepared for this precise moment. As revealed in Revelation 9 verse 15, these angels have been ready to act at every hour, day, month, and year, emphasizing the precision and inevitability of their mission. And what is that mission? Verses 17 and 18 of the same chapter clarify it with horrifying clarity. They were released to execute a specific divine judgment, resulting in the death of a third of humanity. The weapons of destruction employed by this army are described as three plagues, smoke, fire and sulfur emanating from their mouths, reminiscent of the deadliest war weapons. 
This description not only emphasizes the severity of the punishment imposed on the wicked and unrepentant, but also serves as a reflection on the nature of divine justice, which, though severe, is executed with a clear purpose and designated time. Today, with a global population approaching 8.1 billion, John's apocalyptic vision gains an even more impactful context. Imagine the devastation if a third of this immense population, around 2.7 billion people, were to be exterminated. The loss would be colossal, transcending borders and affecting all 195 countries of the world. If the destruction were evenly distributed, each nation would lose approximately 14 million people. For smaller nations with populations below that number, the impact could result in their complete annihilation. Calling this event mass destruction would indeed be an understatement. The chaos that would ensue would engulf the earth, leading humanity into a state of unprecedented fear and despair. This scenario raises questions about the severity of this divine judgment, possibly the most terrible reserved for sinners at the end of times. Although some may dismiss or even scorn this prophecy, biblical history repeatedly reminds us of how God dealt with human iniquity. Scriptures tell us that, in times of extreme corruption, such as in the days of Noah, God felt compelled to intervene drastically. Genesis chapter 6 describes how God observed the wickedness on the earth, where every thought and action of men was only continuous evil. Faced with this depravity, God regretted having created humanity and decided to eradicate that corrupted generation, sparing only Noah, a righteous man who found favor in his eyes. The biblical narrative is replete with examples of God's judgment upon sinners, each revealing both divine justice and mercy. In Genesis 18 and 19, we encounter the tragic story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The iniquity of these cities was so great that the outcry of their sins reached God's ears. Despite Abraham's negotiations, not even ten righteous were found, and God destroyed both cities with fire, reducing them to ashes in an instant. Furthermore, the Exodus story shows us how God dealt with the Egyptians. The ten plagues, culminating in the death of the firstborns and the drowning of the Egyptian forces in the Red Sea, are vivid examples of the severity with which God can act. These events, though extraordinary, pale in comparison to the future judgment that the four angels of the Euphrates will execute, where a third of humanity will be decimated. However, even in the face of this unprecedented destruction, Revelation 9 verses 20 and 21 reveal a dark and disturbing aspect of human nature. The passage tells us that despite the devastating plagues, the rest of humanity did not repent of their deeds. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone and wood, idols that cannot see, hear or walk. They did not repent of their murders, sorceries, sexual immorality or thefts. This refusal to repent after witnessing such destruction is a frightening testimony to human resistance to correction, even when confronted with undeniable evidence of divine power and the inevitability of judgment. It highlights a tragic trait of the human condition, our tendency to ignore the most obvious lessons until we are personally affected. Faced with the visions revealed in Revelation and the stories of past judgments, this is a timely moment for deep personal reflection. The message unfolding before us is not just a warning of imminent destruction, but also an invitation to self-examination. It is essential to ask oneself, in what aspects of my life am I failing to align with divine teachings? Where do I need repentance and transformation? In addition to this personal introspection, there are specific signs that may indicate the approach of the end times, as discussed in the message. One such sign is the gradual departure from Christian principles, not only as an abandonment of faith, but as a deviation towards practices and beliefs that contradict Scripture. This deviation may manifest in an increasing compromise with the world and an expanded tolerance for behaviors and ideologies that are clearly disapproved of in the Bible. 
A second troubling sign is the rise of demonic activity within mainstream entertainment culture. Music and movies, for example, are increasingly imbued with malignant and occult themes, glorifying evil in a way that becomes normative and attractive to the general public. The third sign is detailed in 2 Timothy 3, where scripture foresees a society characterized by a growing love for doctrines that please and comfort at the expense of those that challenge and require personal sacrifice. The passage warns of a time when many will seek a gospel that promotes prosperity and material well-being, ignoring the need for repentance and spiritual transformation. These are symptoms of a culture that is increasingly drifting away from the fundamental values of the gospel, preferring messages that temporarily soothe but fail to provoke true heart and life change. Second, Timothy 3 offers a bleak yet enlightening insight into the state of society in the last days, describing a total collapse of social and moral order. People will be selfish, treacherous, reckless, slanderous, brutal, disobedient to parents, abusive, and lacking self-control. This scenario of complete moral degradation paints a picture of a society where traditional values are discarded, and each individual acts according to their own desires, disregarding moral standards. Verse 5 of 2 Timothy 3 points to one of the greatest challenges for the faithful, People who maintain an outward appearance of religiosity, but internally deny the transformative power of faith. These religious rebels pose a significant threat, for though they may speak the language of faith, their actions reveal a fundamental disconnect from the true principles of Christianity. For Christians living in this context, the crucial question is how to survive and maintain integrity in such a corrupt environment. The answer to this question is found in verses 16 and 17 of the same chapter, reaffirming the value and authority of Scripture. These verses declare that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, ensuring that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The message of God's Word is powerful and transformative. It has the potential to save, forgive, justify, sanctify, purify, transform, regenerate, and ultimately lead the faithful to heaven for all eternity. In this context, an analogy offered by Dr. Tony Evans sheds enlightening light on the importance of living with an eternal perspective. Evans compares the Christian life to reviewing game tape in the NFL. Just as players face Judgment Day every Monday when the Sunday game tape is reviewed to assess the good, the bad and the ugly of their performances, Christians will face a similar day with God. On that day, God will show each person a tape of their life from the moment of conversion to their last day on earth, whether by death or the rapture. This review is not to determine salvation that is already secured for those who are Christians, but rather to evaluate what has been done with the life received in Christ. It will be an assessment of how one lived as a Christian, determining the gain or loss of heavenly rewards. The Apostle Paul, among other New Testament writers, repeatedly emphasizes the importance of this day, not only for understanding what is to come, but also to encourage us to live in a manner that honors this future judgment. In this context, the Bible provides clarity about the events of the last days, but the choice to believe in God's words or to lean on human explanations and reasoning falls on each individual. It is a solemn reminder that life on earth is temporary, and that the choices made here resonate into eternity. Therefore, every moment and every action should be weighed in the light of this eternal truth. The scriptures are filled with warnings about the challenges and dangers of the last days, offering a crucial guide for the faithful on what to expect as the end times approach. These warnings are clear and direct, intended to prepare and strengthen Christians for the turbulent times ahead. 2 Timothy 3, one is particularly eloquent in describing these times as difficult to endure. 
The phrase perilous times or times of great stress and trouble underscores the severity of the challenges we will face, marked by adversities and tribulations that will test the resilience and faith of all. However, it is in 1 Timothy 4, one that we find an even more specific and disturbing warning about the nature of these challenges. The verse reveals that, in later times, some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. This prediction not only highlights the reality of an apostasy, but also underscores the malevolent spiritual forces behind it. The deceitful spirits and teachings of demons are identified as the primary causes that will lead some who were once firm in their faith to stray. As we reflect on the scriptures and consider the signs of the times, it is evident that the biblical warnings about the last days are manifesting in concrete and impactful ways. The scenario described in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 1 Timothy 4, 1, where times of difficulty prevail and many depart from the faith, resonates deeply with the reality we observe around us today. Adding to these observations, 2 Peter 3, 3, 4 offers us another crucial perspective, foreseeing the arrival of scoffers in the last days. These individuals, following their own sinful desires, will mock Christians and question the promise of Christ's second coming. This skepticism and mockery are not just verbal challenges, they reflect a deeper rejection of the values and beliefs that underpin the Christian faith. These verses highlight a troubling trend in contemporary society, a growing disbelief and cynicism regarding spiritual matters, accompanied by an increasing indulgence in personal desires that contradict biblical principles. This attitude manifests in various forms, from disregard for the scriptures to open ridicule against those fervently awaiting Christ's return. In addition to these spiritual and moral challenges, we also face physical tribulations such as extreme weather conditions, earthquakes, floods and famines. These events are not just isolated natural disasters. They are consistent with biblical prophecies that warn about the difficulties of the last days. As we observe the world around us, it's easy to feel overwhelmed by the challenges and turbulence of current times. However, as believers, we are called to adopt a different perspective, one of hope and unwavering trust in God's promise. Scripture offers powerful words of encouragement that are essential for sustaining our faith amidst the storms. Acts 2.17 reminds us of an extraordinary promise for the last days. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. This prophecy is not only a reminder of the ongoing power and presence of the Holy Spirit, but also an assurance that, regardless of external circumstances, God continues to actively work in the lives of His people. Furthermore, in Titus 2.13, we are encouraged to live in anticipation of our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ. This verse directs us to keep our focus on the promise of Christ's return, which is the culmination of our faith and the source of our eternal hope. In the face of current adversities, whether social, economic or even spiritual, it is vital that we do not allow ourselves to be discouraged or distracted. The rumors of war, pandemic crises, the growing perversion in music and media, and the overall decline of moral standards are indeed concerning. However, these are not reasons for despair, but rather for a renewed focus on Jesus Christ and His promise of redemption. Reflecting on the messages of spiritual leaders that have touched our lives, the words of Derek Prince resonate with particular urgency regarding the last days. His words during a sermon deeply illustrate the need for a personal and decisive response to the times we live in. Derek Prince, in one of his powerful altar calls, expressed, Dear friends, we are living in the midst of a wicked, twisted world and an immoral, dishonest and untrustworthy generation. You need to be saved from this. You need to come out of this. You need to be changed. You need to be different. 
This exhortation highlights the gravity of the moral and spiritual condition of the contemporary world and the imperative need for salvation and personal transformation. He continues, directly appealing to those who have not yet committed to Christ. If there is anyone here this morning who has never turned their back on this godless world and this wicked generation, I want to give you one last chance to do so. Do not fall into the devil's trap. Save yourself from this perverse generation. These words are not just an invitation. They are a warning of the urgency of the situation and the imminent need to make a decision that can alter a person's eternal destiny. Adrian Rogers, an influential preacher known for his ability to convey complex truths in an accessible manner, offered a striking analogy about the state of the modern world. He cited Vance Havner, describing our civilization as a chimpanzee with a blowtorch in a room full of dynamite. This vivid image highlights the dangerous combination of technological advancements and moral immaturity that characterizes our era. Rogers emphasizes that while we may be advanced scientifically and technologically, morally we are still in kindergarten. He compellingly argues that neither science nor politics nor social reforms are adequate solutions to humanity's fundamental problems. The true solution lies in spiritual transformation that can only come through a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. This thought deeply connects with the warnings about the last days found in 1 John 2.18, where it is mentioned that we are in the last hour and that many antichrists have already appeared. This verse not only alerts about the coming of the Antichrist, but also about the presence of many others who embody the spirit of the Antichrist already operating among us. The Antichrist as a figure represents a direct opposition to Christ, attempting to replace or contradict what is divinely established. 1. John 4, 3 expands on this idea, explaining that any spirit that does not confess Jesus as Lord is not from God and is indeed from the spirit of the Antichrist. This means that the spirit of the Antichrist is not just a future threat, but a current reality. This presence manifests in various forms, including through ideologies and behaviors that actively reject the teachings and sovereignty of Jesus. The reality of the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist already operating in the world is a biblical truth that requires our attention and understanding. This spirit is primarily characterized by its rejection of Jesus Christ as Lord and King. Observing this phenomenon is not just a theological matter, but also a practical reality evident in contemporary society. Today, countless individuals, institutions and establishments openly refuse to acknowledge Jesus Christ for who he is. They deny his divinity, his exclusive role as the way to truth and life, and even the fundamental events of his death and resurrection. This denial is not merely a difference of religious opinion, but a clear manifestation of the spirit of the Antichrist. This rejection has profound implications not only for the Christian faith, but for global morals and ethics. When the core truths of Christianity are denied, a spiritual and moral vacuum arises that can be filled by ideologies fundamentally hostile to biblical principles. Furthermore, Revelation 12.12 12 offers another intense perspective on the challenges of the last days. Rejoice, O heavens! and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. This verse not only highlights the seriousness of the spiritual situation in the world, but also the urgency with which the devil is operating, aware that his time is limited. The warning about the devil's limited time and his intense wrath, as expressed in Revelation 12.12, 12, is a truth with profound implications for all of us today. This understanding should catalyze a serious and committed response from Christians, as there are indeed eternal consequences at stake. As the devil knows that his days are numbered, he intensifies his efforts to divert people from the truth and lead them down the path of destruction. This effort manifests in various ways in society. The increase of evil can be seen in entertainment, where values contrary to Christian principles are often promoted. 
Additionally, many modern ideologies that deviate from biblical teachings are also part of this scheme, reflecting the devil's attempt to sow confusion and disorientation. 2 Corinthians 4 4 deepens our understanding of this dynamic, explaining that the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, preventing them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This verse not only identifies the enemy's tactic, but also calls us to recognize the gravity of the spiritual battle in which we are engaged. The devil's aim is to obstruct people's spiritual vision, preventing them from recognizing the truth and salvation offered in Christ. The reflection on the power of the God of this world, Satan, to blind the unbelievers to the truth of the gospel, reveals a deep spiritual battle that takes place in the realm of ideas, opinions and values of society. This influence extends far beyond what many may perceive, infiltrating institutions, philosophies and even the means by which cultures are formed and maintained. The devil, as described in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, uses his abilities to obscure people's spiritual perception, preventing them from seeing the truth and the light of Christ's gospel. This veil over perception is not merely a spiritual or theological phenomenon, but manifests itself very tangibly and practically in people's everyday lives. One of the most powerful vehicles of this influence is money and the pursuit of profit at all costs, which has become a modern idol for many. Companies and corporations, driven by the desire for profit, often employ strategies that not only exploit consumers, but also monitor, analyze, and manipulate their choices and behaviors. This reality is a clear demonstration of how the values imposed by the God of this world can distort human priorities, causing materialism to supplant higher and spiritual values. The love of money, described in the Bible as the root of all evil, is an emblematic example of how materialism can become an idol. This idolatry is not just a matter of misplaced priority. It has deep spiritual ramifications, affecting the way people see the world, themselves and God, Ultimately, it leads to spiritual blindness, where people are unable to recognize their need for God and the truth of the gospel. Matthew 24, 12 offers a powerful warning about the spiritual and moral conditions of the last days. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. This prediction by Jesus not only describes a deterioration in interpersonal relationships, but also points to a profound erosion of the fundamental commandment he emphasized to love God above all things and to love one's neighbor as oneself. The connection between the increase in wickedness and the cooling of love is especially relevant today when we observe a widespread lack of compassion, kindness and respect for human life. This decline in true love is a direct reflection of people's increasing distance from the divine principles that should guide their lives and interactions. This phenomenon not only indicates a failure to fulfill the second greatest commandment, but also suggests a deeper failure to understand and receive God's love. How can we properly love others if we fail to recognize and internalize the love that God has for us? The inability to truly love oneself and others is intrinsically linked to people's disconnection from the source of all true love, which is God. Ephesians 5.15, 16 complements this message with an exhortation to live wisely and diligently. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. This verse not only acknowledges the prevalent wickedness in today's world, but also calls us to a life of wisdom and purpose, seizing every opportunity to do good in the midst of evil. The malignant influence of Satan is profound and multifaceted, impacting not only the large structures of society, but also the daily lives of individuals. He steals people's time, occupies their thoughts, blinds their eyes to the truth, and deafens their ears to the redeeming message of the gospel. 
Modernity has brought with it a series of distractions that often divert people from fundamental spiritual practices such as prayer and Bible study. In the midst of the frantic race to achieve material success, many find themselves increasingly alienated from their spiritual needs and, crucially, from God. This desensitization to evil and the spiritual has profound consequences, not only for individual spiritual health, but also for the community and society as a whole. The words in 2 Timothy 4, 7 resonate strongly here. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. This verse not only encourages reflection on life as a journey of faith, but also on the persistent struggle to remain faithful amid challenges and distractions. The real challenge is to ensure that we are truly following the path that Christ has laid out. As mentioned in Matthew 7, 22, 23, many may believe they are in communion with God through their outward actions, prophesying, casting out demons and performing miracles, but the definitive criterion of spiritual authenticity is recognition by Christ. Jesus' shocking statement, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, warns of the danger of a superficial faith that focuses on external gestures rather than true internal transformation and a personal relationship with God. Reflection on the correct direction in our relationship with Jesus Christ is vital especially when many may be oblivious to the signs that they are following a wrong path. Recognizing these signs is the first step in making essential corrections on the journey of faith. Romans 1 verse 24 offers a penetrating insight into one of the clear signs of being on the wrong path. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. This verse reflects a society that has embraced hedonism, living without self-control and immersed in corruption. The warning here is grave. When a person finds themselves sinning without feeling conviction, inner struggle, remorse or guilt, they may be experiencing the withdrawal of God's restraining hand, allowing them to fully indulge in their sinful and shameful desires. This is a dangerous spiritual condition, indicating not only a departure from God's laws, but also a state of rejection by one's own conscience, which should act as an internal moral break. When this conscience is silenced, the individual is effectively on a path that can lead to eternal condemnation. Proverbs 8 verse 20 reinforces the importance of following the path of righteousness and justice. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the paths of justice. This verse reminds us that any path that deviates from justice and the teachings of Christ is inherently a dangerous path. Righteousness and justice are measured not only by external actions, but by the guidance of the heart and mind in accordance with the Word of God. Ensuring that we are treading the path God has planned for us is crucial in the journey of faith. The best way to assess this is through the fruits of the Spirit, as outlined in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. This passage of Scripture not only defines the qualities that should be evident in the life of a follower of Christ, but also serves as a barometer to measure the authenticity and depth of our spiritual journey. Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23 tell us, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. These fruits are indicative of a life deeply rooted in God and are tangible evidence of the Holy Spirit working within us. The presence of these fruits is a strong indication that we are in God's will and walking according to His Word. The absence of these fruits, or the presence of their opposites, such as hatred, sorrow, impatience, malevolence, unfaithfulness, harshness and impulsiveness, suggests that perhaps we are straying from the path that leads to full life in Christ. Following a path that does not produce these fruits is, as the Bible warns us, not only unproductive, but potentially dangerous to our spiritual health and salvation. The human path, guided by selfish desires and ambitions, 
often leads to despair and destruction, as the Bible repeatedly reminds us. In contrast, God's path is described as eternal and full of hope, a path that leads us to a destination where He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. Revelation 21 verse 4